Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we will uh, study the lesson number nine. We study uh, sensors of pressure and force. Um, I think I will be able to finish this lesson in one, um, in one, uh, only today, in one section, in two hour session. Uh, so tomorrow, if I have time, most probably I will uh, start making some examples which can be useful for the final examination, some calculation, so that you can start uh, practicing with the exercises. Uh, before uh, starting this topic about sensors of force and pressure, uh, I would like just to discuss very briefly about, well, I, I always say very briefly and then I talk for half an hour, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but um, there, there was uh, there was a question in the first test which was evidently quite difficult because uh, only two students answered correctly and uh, all the others basically, uh, but everybody but one uh, this, uh, who didn't uh, reply basically uh, chose the wrong answer. Uh, I guess the problem is that it was kind of misleading or at least the uh, the topic was is not very clear, and if basically everybody but two failed, it means that I was not able to explain this topic uh, clearly enough. So uh, I will try to explain it better to make possible for you to better understand this topic. Um, the question uh, was this: I asked. How can you measure the real part of a voltage referred to a phase fee? And most of you answered using a true RMS voltmeter or using a rectifier controlled by an operation amplifier to overcome the non-linearity of the diode followed by a low-pass filter multiplying the result by 1.11. Uh, somebody also answered using a a thermal RMS to DC converter. There are two basic misunderstandings uh, in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, answers to the, to the question. Why? Which one? Uh, the first one is th the concept itself of real part of a voltage. Uh, if you answer it, that you can measure the real part of a voltage using a true RMS voltmeter or a thermal RMS to, RMS to DC converter, it means that you believe that the real part of the voltage is the RMS value of the voltage. Um, this is quite common. I don't know why, but many students think that uh, the real part of the voltage is the RMS value of the voltage. But they are two totally different things. Uh, again, what is the, re the RMS value of a voltage? You know that you have a voltage V of T, root means square. It means that first of all, you have to square the voltage, okay? Then you have to take the mean of this voltage, so you have to integrate it, integrate it over a period uh, t, and then divide by 1 over t, and then you have to make the square root. So square, we square the voltage, mean, we take the mean of the voltage, root, we take the square root. From the practical point of view, it means that, for instance, if you have a sine wave, you have to square, so this is v of t, then You have to square this voltage, which is giving you something like that. And then, so this is voltage square. Of course, this is the time. This is the time. And then you need 
the average and the average will be this. This is the root means square, okay? The real part of a voltage is to something totally different. Again, you have your sine wave and you can draw a phasor in a complex plane. So you have the real and the imaginary axis. You have a voltage V. You draw it with the phase uh, phi. And this corresponds to a voltage which behaves like this, okay? Again, pardon my poor drawing skills. It means that as this phasor rotates in time, you take the projection of the phasor on the imaginary axis, and that will give you the value of the corresponding voltage in time uh, that you find on the, on the graph where you plot the voltage against the time, okay? So, you have this phasor, if you have this voltage, if you have another voltage with another phase, for instance, this voltage, then you take the projection and You have this phase, this oh, this voltage, okay? Here you have a phase, phi, which is much larger. If you have a phase very slow, very low, sorry, you have this voltage here. And then you have this kind of voltage, okay? So, uh, once you have your phasor corresponding uh, to your voltage, the real part is simply the projection of the phasor on the real axis, okay? This is the real part. This is the real part of the voltage V. Uh, this is not the RMS value. Why? Because the RMS value doesn't depend on the phase of the voltage compared, uh, referred to the start of the time. The phase can be either expressed as a phase with respect of the imaginary, the complex plane. So you can either say that your voltage has a certain phase with respect of the real and imaginary axis, or, alternatively, you can say that there is a time delay between uh, the phase, the sign, and the start of the time, where the time is zero. They are the same thing. Uh, either the phase or the time, you still have a displacement in phase of time with respect of the time of zero or the real and imaginary axis. Uh, here, if you change the phase of the voltage, you still have the same RMS value. Think about it. If we make the time starting from here, instead of from this point,
let's say that now the time starts here. So the new time equal to zero is here. Is here. Well, still you will have the same square. So the average is still the same. You just start half a period later or quarter of period later, but who cares? Still you have the same square of the voltage, still you have the same RMS. It doesn't matter where you start. You still have to have at least one period to calculate the RMS value. So you really don't mind if there's a phase displacement. Because whenever here you have the integral from zero to t, then you are taking one period. So if the period starts here and ends here, or if the period starts here and ends here, you still have the same <coughs> result, okay? You still have the square, actually the period is here. Uh, but who cares? One you square, once you square it, you get the same value. So you really don't mind where you start integrating because you have still to integrate one period. When it comes to the RM, to the real part, well, this changes because as you change the phase, as you change the start of the time, t equal to zero, then you change the phasor, <coughs> and therefore, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> you change the real part. In this case, you have a large real part of the voltage. Here, you have a much lower real part of the voltage. So the real part of the voltage depends on the choice that you make of the time equal to zero, or in a complex plane, the, 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 the choice of the phase reference. What does it mean? It means that you can have the same vector, the same phasor of the voltage. You still have the same Voltage, not very same, more or less. Then if you choose this axis as the real and imaginary axis, then the real part will be this one. If you choose, let's say, this axis, okay, then the same voltage will have a different real part. You can choose the real and imaginary part as you wish. You can rotate them from here to here. The real part of the voltage it depends on the choice of the phase that you have, because it will be the projection on the real axis as you decided to take the reference. Okay, so uh, you can all when you say that you want to measure the real and imaginary part of a voltage you must always specify with the respect to what? With respect of a time, if you are watching the voltage in a time domain, or with respect of the choice of phase of these two axes. The, ax the voltage might be the same, but if you choose a phase of the axis differently, then you have a different projection of the voltage on the real axis, and therefore a different uh, real part of the voltage. That's why I said refer to a phase fee, because you must always give a reference of phase, which becomes your time equal to zero. Uh, so definitely the RMS 
uh, the RMS value doesn't give you this information. The RMS value gives you information only about, in quote marks, the module of the voltage. The larger is this sign, the larger will be the RMS. But if it moves in time, if it changes the phase, then you don't have, uh, you, the RMS value doesn't change at all. Uh, so the RMS value only gives you information about the amplitude of the voltage. It doesn't give you any information about the phase. When you want to measure the, uh, the real part or the imaginary part of a voltage, you need also the information about the phase. That's why I told you that you must uh, measure, how, that I was asking how to measure the real part of a voltage referred to a phase phi. So our uh, reference phase will be phi. Uh, why, this was the first problem. So the RMS value has nothing to do with the, uh, with the real part of a voltage. The second uh, thing, which probably was not very clear, is about the rectifier, because somebody selected, well, I can use a rectifier. And I intentionally wrote an answer, which was very long, because surprisingly, when the answer is very long, people think it has more details, so it's more likely to be correct. And uh, I explained to you that you can use, for instance, a rectifier to have a sign like this. And once you rectify it, you get something like that. Okay. So this is the voltage in time. And this is the rectified voltage. And uh, I explained, for instance, how you can achieve an ideal rectifier by overcoming the nonlinearity of the diodes using an operational amplifier, which in feedbacks adjust the voltage so that it will be able to provide the current so that you have always a linear response on the output, despite having a non -linear, the non-linearity of the diode. So the system will adjust the voltages so that it overcomes the non-linearity of, of the diode. Fine. Uh, probably somebody remember this, remembered this graph from the lecture about uh, the measurement of real and imaginary part of the voltage. Why? Because typically, how do you measure the real and imaginary part of, of a voltage? Well, you take your voltage, and you flip the polarity. Uh, according to a control voltage VC, which flips, which gives the command to this polarity inverter. So it's just a polarity inverter. It does nothing else than just convert, uh, invert the polarity of this voltage. Either it goes straight or invert it. And then, what you obtain here, let's call it V prime. If you have your voltage like this, and, you con and your control voltage, let me take Like this, control voltage high means that you have to use the straight polarity, so the output voltage 
will be exactly as the input. Con oh, sorry, control voltage here. The control voltage low means that you have to flip the polarity, so this voltage will be flipped. And again, high voltage control, so it means that polarity is straight, okay? So schematically, here the polarity inverter is straight, here two, and here is inverted, okay? And then we use a low-pass filter. The low-pass filter will take the average, okay? Now, this does look as a simple inverter, uh, sorry, a rectifier, right? What's the difference? Well, the difference is in the fact that here we have only a phase which is zero compared to the reference. What happens if the voltage has a phase displacement? Where is the rack? For instance, what if we have something like that. Your control voltage will be this is the time, as usual. Your control voltage will be the same. So this is the voltage in time. This is the control voltage. So, what we have to do, again, is to take this voltage, which is in the straight polarity, so it becomes like this. Then this will be inverted. So this is positive, becomes negative. And this is negative, becomes positive. So here you see that this part is like an S, like a year, is inverted if you compare it to, to this part. And so on. Straight and inverted. It seems somebody wrote a question in MS Teams. No. I heard some sound. No. Okay. Uh, so, now we don't have zero phase difference between our reference phase given by VC and the phase of the voltage. Now we have 90 degrees. And we still apply the same, uh, the same system. What's the result here? If you calculate the average, you get zero. It's the same volt. Well, the amplitude of the voltage at the entrance is the same. So if you calculate the RMS value of this voltage and this voltage, you get the same RMS value. Because the square of this and the square of this averaged, they give you the same value. They are just shifted 90 degrees, quarter of a period. But the amplitude is the same. So the RMS, and they are both signs, so the RMS value will be the same. If you take a voltmeter, which measures the RMS value, and you connect it, you get the same voltage, because the RMS voltage of this is equal to the RMS voltage of this. But if you connect a polarity inverter and you flip it with the same voltage, VC, you get either this average or zero average. Why? Because now we take into account also the phase of the voltage with the respect of the control voltage. This is our reference phase, okay? This is uh, our choice of phase as a reference. As you see, the output now depends on the phase. And if you make some mathematics, it turns out 
that the average, the average of this uh, flipped voltage depends on the amplitude, of course, of the voltage times the cosine of the phase between V and C. Here the cosine uh, is 1 because you have zero phase, so you get this large average. Here we have uh, 90 degrees, so the cosine of 90 degrees is 0, and that's why here we have 0. All the phases in the middle will give you a part of the voltage, a, a component of the voltage, which is proportional to the, uh, RM, to the uh, real part of the RMS value. Oh, sorry, the, uh, the real part of the voltage. Why? Because you have the amplitude of the voltage times the cosine of the... Uh, of the of the of the phase between the voltage and the reference, okay? So that's why you have to use this polarity inverter, followed by a, a low pass filter to get the average. Of course, uh, as you as, as I predicted, I took half an hour to explain this thing, and not it was not very brief, as I uh, promised. So I hope now it is clear. If you want to measure the imaginary part, then instead of using this control voltage, you have to shift by 90 degrees the control voltage. So again, you measure uh, technically the real part because the voltage will be proportional to the voltage times the cosine. But now, if you shift by 90 degrees the angle, the cosine becomes a sine. And therefore, you measure the imaginary part and not the real part anymore. Okay, very long introduction, but I hope this is uh, clear. Just give me a feedback uh, in MS Teams. Tell me if it's clear or if the explanation still failed to deliver the, the message. So please let me know if there is still some question about that. Uh, why do you need to measure the real and imaginary part of a voltage. This might be a question. Otherwise, this is just uh, is exercised on the blackboard without practical application. You remember, for instance, if you want to measure an inductance, you use an inverting amplifier. You have a known resistor, the resistance. You have, for instance, here, the unknown impedance you want to measure. And you know that the resistance and the inductance depend on the input voltage that is known, the resistance which is known, and um, so the output voltage depends on, okay, the output voltage is equal to negative this impedance divided by the resistance times V1. These two parameters are known, this is unknown, you can derive both the resistance and the inductance. In order to calculate the resistance and the inductance, you need the real and imaginary part of the voltage, of the output voltage, referred to V1. So this will become our control voltage because this V1 becomes our reference phase. So you need the real and imaginary part of the output voltage referred to our reference phase, V1, and they will give you, this real and imaginary part, the resistance and the inductance. So this is an example where, uh, uh, where you need to measure the real and imaginary part of the output. Okay, somebody says that it is clear. I hope it is clear, so it is clear also for the others. And now, finally, we can start this lecture. Okay, sensors of four, uh, is there any other question about um, about uh, other topics? If so, please let me know. Now let's start with this, finally, uh, the ninth lecture. Sensor of force and pressure. Well, the first sensor that we, may, that we will study, sensor about force, is in fact a sensor of strain. And it's based on a very basic principle. You probably know how to measure, how to calculate the resistance of a metallic, uh, or generally speaking, any type of material. Um, why? 
you know that if you have a wire, you have a cylindric wire. Uh, the resistance is given by, by the resistivity rho times the length of the wire divided by the cross section S. And what happens if you apply a force to this wire? So you have your wire, you apply a force, and you deform the wire. The length will become larger, and simultaneously the cross section will become lower Y. Because if you take a, typically, if you take a material and you elongate this material, you make it longer, then automatically it will shrink. There, uh, uh, to my mind, it doesn't. I, I don't recall any any material that if you stretch it, it becomes bigger. Typically, if you take a material and you stretch it, it becomes smaller, like the cross section. Um, so what happens to the resistance of this wire when you stretch the wire? Well, the length becomes bigger here, the cross section becomes smaller, in total the resistance increases. For some reasons, students say it doesn't change because they see something increasing the length, something decreasing the cross section, so they think they compensate each other. And um, no, because the cross section is at the denominator of this fraction. So if L increases, it contributes to make the resistance bigger. And if the cross section decreases, but it's downstairs. So it will make, again, the resistance bigger. So both a longer uh, while, a uh, bigger length, and the smaller cross section both contribute to, uh, to, to have a bigger resistance. Now, you can approximate the relative change of the resistance uh, with this formula. The relative change of the resistance, which means delta R, how much the resistance change, changed, divided by the resistance before the change, before the, the, um, the force is applied, is almost equal. Now, this is an approximation because that should be almost equal here. The change of resistivity over the resistivity, the change of length divided by the length, minus the, the uh, change of cross-section divided by the cross-section. Why is it so? Now, there, is a lot of, the, of line, there are a lot of lines here with formula. Uh, don't get scared. It's simpler than it looks like. Uh, how can you write down uh, the resistance, the function of a resistance changing because of this force that we apply? Uh, you can approximate in taking the derivatives to the first order. So you have the resistance here, R, is almost equal, almost equal because we stop our approximation to the first derivatives. You could continue uh, to, with higher derivatives. It's equal to the resistance at zero. Zero is the state when no force is applied. Plus the derivative of the resistance with respect of re the resistivity times the change of resistivity, how much the resistivity changes from uh, between the, these two conditions, when you apply the force and when you have no force. So you stretch you, the wire, you change slightly the resistivity, so you have a change rho minus rho zero of resistivity, you multiply times the derivative of R with respect uh, of the resistivity, and you get this contribution. And you have to do the same for, other, for the other components. So you have the re derivative of resistance with respect of L, the length, times the change of L, L min minus L0, plus the derivative of the resistance with respect of the cross-section, times the change of the cross-section, S minus S0. This is something that you have probably seen uh, in mathematics. You can approximate a, a function uh, by taking the, the derivative, uh, the first derivative uh, times, with, if, if the function has only one variable, you take the deri derivative only with respect of that variable times the change of that variable plus the second derivative, then you have the factorials and blah, blah, blah. And then if you continue 
uh, to, to infinite derivatives, you get perfectly the functions. Here we stop at the first derivative uh, just to have an approximation. So that's why we have here almost equal. And here, of course, we have a function of three variables, which change. So we don't have only one variable, so you have to make the derivatives to all the variables. Okay? Um, but we don't want r. We want the difference of r. So we have to take delta r, which is r minus r0. And then this is almost equal to these three contributions. Now, if you take the derivative of the resistance with, with respect of rho, you, you, are, you get L divided by S. So you take the, resist, the derivative of R with respect of rho, you simply have this factor L divided by S. Okay? So you have L divided by S times the change of resistivity. Plus, you have the derivative of the resistance with respect of L, and here you have rho divided by S, Therefore, we have, we have rho divided by uh, s, and then you have the derivative of the resistance with respect of the cross section, so you have negative rho l divided by uh, s square. Uh, so, this is then if you take this value and you divide by uh, the resistance because we want the relative change of the resistance, how much the resistance changed, divided by the value of the resistance at the beginning, because we want to see how much in proportion the resistance changed. So you divide this by rho L divided by S, and you get one over rho. So you have the, var the change of the resistivity, rho minus rho zero, divided by rho, because once you divide by the resistance, these two terms disappear, and you are left with rho. And if you divide these uh, two terms by resistance, you are left with L. And once you divide again here by the resistance, you are left with S. So once you divide, you take this expression, which is delta R, and you divide it by R, you are, you are left with this equation. And again, this is not really what we want. Because this is the relative change of the resistance. It tells you, well, the resistance changed by uh, 10 parts per million, 100 parts per million. Uh, what we want to know is, the, uh, is how much, is how large is the relative change of the resistance. 1%, oh, no, too much, difficult is not 1%, 0.001%, 10 parts per million, whatever, compared to how much we deformed the wire. For instance, we apply uh, 10 ppm, 10 parts per million of deformation. Deformation means relative deformation is delta L divided by L. Okay? Delta L is here, how much I I uh, made my wire longer, delta L, divided by L, the initial length, tells you how much, is the, how longer the wire is compared to the initial length. So we want, as a matter of fact, um, to know how much is the relative change of the resistance compared to the relative change of uh, length, the relative deformation, so that you know, I don't know, you stretch the wire 10 ppm, 10 parts per million, and you get, for instance, 20 ppm of relative change of resistance. This tells you the response of the sensor. In order to do so, uh, we have to sim or not simplify, well, uh, continue the analysis of this equation, and we remember that uh, uh, we can express the relative change of the cross section as a function of the relative change of length. And we know that we, for uh, basically all materials, we have 
the so-called Poisson ratio. I don't know if the pronunciation is correct. So if there is any French uh, speaker uh, among you, so please me know, let me know if the pronunci pronunciation is really Poisson or any different. This is a number which tells you uh, if you change the length uh, of delta L over L, how, uh, how large is the reduction of the cross-section? Uh, in other words, there are materials that you can elongate and they almost do not change in diameter. You can extend them very well, very easily, and they don't get much uh, smaller in cross section. There, it depends on the on the material themselves. Uh, there are the materials that, on the contrary, as soon as you start stretching them, they shrink very much. This is a characteristic of the materials. Uh, each material has a different Poisson ratio. So you can uh, check it out. There are some tables, and they tell you for different materials which is the Poisson ratio. So for a given material, you can replace delta S over S by this expression, which tells you that delta S over S is minus 2 mu, the Poisson ratio, delta L over L. So finally, once we want uh, the relative change of resistance, how much the resistance changes, divided by the relative change of length, then you get 1, which is given by this term, delta L divided by L, plus 2 times the Poisson ratio, plus this coefficient here, which tells you how much the resistivity changes uh, when you change the length. Now, for there are two classes of strain gauges. Um, Basically, there are the strain gauges based on, uh, on metals and on semiconductors. When it comes to semiconductors, uh, <laughs> to strain gauges based on metals, uh, basically all the effect is given by these two terms. The relative change of length and uh, the relative change of cross-section. Um, basically, uh, in a metal, if you arrive to the point where the resistivity changes because you stretch the wire, so you have, I don't know, copper, and you stretch it up to the point that the resistivity of copper changes. Uh, well, in that case, it means that you have to a point where your sensor is not reversible anymore. You stretch it way too much and the only place where you can put the sensor probably is the garbage. Because once you release the strain, it doesn't go back anymore. You deform, you deform the structure of the material in a non-reversible way. So you cannot really use the sensor anymore. Uh, so far, we uh, presented this approximation only to the first order. So, uh, if you take this equation here, <coughs> sorry, I should have brought some water. If you take this, <coughs> again, I apologize. If you take the change of uh, resistance over the, um, the relative deformation, now just to, to make our life easier, we will call epsilon the relative change of, uh, of length, so the relative deformation. Now, uh, you can express it as a function of uh, not only epsilon to the first power, but also epsilon squared, epsilon cubed, and so on. Uh, we can identify different parameters which will help us to classify different types of strain gauges, and they will tell us basically when to choose one strain gauge and when to choose another one. Uh, the first parameter is K, which is simply, if you watch this graph here, you have different 
relative change of resistance over relative change of length. Uh, here you have some straight lines, and k is simply the slope of this line. So it tells you the derivative of the relative change of resistance divided by the relative uh, deformation epsilon. How this tells you the response, how large is the response of the sensor. Uh, you have some deformation epsilon, and how much is the, how large is the response, how large is the change of the resistance. Uh, then we have a temperature coefficient of the sensitivity. So it tells you how much this slope, which is giving you the response, changes when you change the temperature. For instance, at 20 degrees you might have this response, but if you warm it up, then you have a different slope. So the slope changes. So the response of the sensor also changes. And then you have also an offset. So uh, sometimes, <coughs> again, sorry. <coughs> sometimes uh, the slope is not only, uh, it does not only change in, in the amplitude, but also has some offset. So you have temperature coefficient of the resistance. It tells you that the resistance itself shifts because of the resistance. Now, as I said, uh, there are two classes of uh, strain gauges. The first one is metal, the second semiconductor. Let's see the typical parameters for these uh, strain gauges. K, as I told you, is the gain, okay? So is the ratio between, in this case, the derivative, but just simply stated is the, uh, is the ratio of uh, the relative change of resistance divided by the relative elongation. Uh, and it's about two to four. What does it mean? It means that in this equation, as I told you, we don't consider <coughs> the part where uh, we change, I apologize, I have to drink some water. I do apologize, it's really <coughs> Um, as I said here, we have uh, for metallic strain gauges, we don't consider the piezo resistive coefficient, which means uh, the effect that you obtain in some materials when you, uh, when you squeeze them or stretch them to change the resistivity. It's the counterpart of the piezoelectric effect that we have studied last week. So we have only these uh, two terms. And if you have two to four, it means that here you can have a Poisson ratio, which is uh, something like uh, uh, zero, five, one, something like that. Okay. Uh, if you go and check, uh, to, to check the table of, of metals, you find out that, that the Poisson ratio of metals is about this, zero, five, one, something like that. That's why here you get two to four. Semiconductors, on the other end, have, uh, again, a response much larger. Sensitivity is much larger. It means that you apply the same relative deformation epsilon, delta L over L, and you get a response which is two order of magnitude larger. Okay, so you have your delta L over L, and we call it epsilon. You apply this defor relative deformation. Can you still hear me? Because I moved the microphone. Uh, you apply this relative deformation to the sensor, and you get a relative change of resistance. So if you have a meta strain gauges, a meta strain gauge, this will be two to four times bigger than the relative change of length. 
if you have a semiconductive strain gauge, this relative change of resistance will be 100, 125, 150 times bigger than this. So uh, automatically you might say, okay, why would I choose a metal strain gauge if I can use a semiconductor, a semiconductive strain gauge, if I have a response which is much larger? Well, that must be a drawback, otherwise nobody would use meta strain gauge. And you can see the drawback immediately after. Uh, when you consider C2, if you forget what C2 is, C2 is the coefficient of the second power of the relative elongation. So this coefficient C2 is a clear indicator of the linearity of the sensor. Because if this coefficient and the others which multiply the higher powers at zero, then you have a sensor which is perfectly linear. Because the output, delta R over R, is simply proportional to the first power of epsilon, the relative change of, uh, of the length. Because you have simply only this C1 coefficient. So you have a proportional relationship between epsilon and delta R over R. On the contrary, if you have C2, it means that you don't have only the linear component, but you have also the uh, component proportional to the square. And therefore, the sensor is not linear anymore. Now, let's see this C2, which is the coefficient of the second power. For metals, it's basically zero. So, wow, the sensor is linear. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Uh, when it comes to semiconductors, however, no, it's not that easy. You have uh, considerable uh, coefficient C2, much larger. So it means that here you cannot neglect this epsilon squared component anymore. The sensor is not linear. So a very basic answer to how to choose the, same, the strain gauges is asking what is the application you want to use the strain gauge for? Uh, is important for you the linearity? Well, in that case, you might need to go for meta strain gauges because semiconductive strain gauges are not your, uh, your solution. Is it important for you to have a large response because you have, for instance, very little uh, epsilon, very little defo relative deformation? Well, in that case, you need to go for semiconductive uh, strain gauges because the meta strain gauges might have a response too little for your application. Then there are other parameters that we have explained, the temperature coefficient of K and of the resistance. And the difference here is not that large as uh, for uh, C2 and K, but still uh, it's in, somehow it's better to have meta strain gauges. Here, we don't have orders of magnitude difference, but still it's better to have meta strain gauges to have more stable uh, response. How do you uh, actually have a strain gauge? When you go to buy a strain gauge, uh, you don't have a single wire. You have multiple wires directly bonded in a resin that you attach to the device you want to measure the deformation of. So there are these little devices you can see through them that there is this sort of plastic. Uh, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's really plastic. Um, it's a resin probably. Where inside you can see there are these, uh, these wires. <coughs> and, then, and therefore, uh, these wires are in series. They are exposed to the same uh, strain. So... This is the sensitive direction. You have to apply the force in this direction, this direction. And the force is applied to all the, the wires. And you measure the resistance between these two points. So these wires are in series. It's like if you have a much longer wire, uh, but instead of, have, of having a long, uh, a long um, sensor, you have them folded in a compact space. Uh, yeah, it's a resin. Yeah, it was written here, I didn't realize. <clears throat> so, uh, 
sorry, again. <coughs> uh, the purpose of the resin is to transmit mechanical stress uh, to, the, to the metals which compose, compose, uh, composes the, the strain gauge and also to avoid that the metal will touch the metallic, the, the, the device you want to measure the strain of. Why? Because this is, these are typically used, for instance, on mecha mechanical parts, uh, something which bends, something which uh, rotates, and it has some uh, shear, some, some deformation on, on rotational axis. And uh, so typically you have to attach them, to glue them on some uh, part of um, some device which is metallic. If you add the wire directly, they will be conductive and they will be shorted by the device itself. So you need also electrical insulation. So you probably see here these, compo these parts where they are connected, the wires, and you see that uh, here the wire is much larger. So maybe I can highlight it on the blackboard. Try to find out why. Meanwhile, I clean the blackboard. Try to find out why we have these connecting parts or this connecting this uh, section, which are quite large. Any idea? In other words. You have your strain gauge. And you have multiple wires. You don't have this kind of structure. But you have this structure. Here, you have the, these connecting parts between the wires, which are, which are much larger, okay? Why? Because as a matter of fact, you have just to connect the two wires. So why do I need to have more material here? They are still in series, even if they are like this. Any idea? Let's see if you if you can answer me. Remember that this is the sensitive direction. So it means that I want to measure the force applied in this direction. Okay? And I want to measure only this force. Only the force in this direction, not the force in other directions. So, any idea why I need these parts? Let's see. I will give you another 20 seconds. Okay, if nobody can guess, the answer is that I said, as I said, I want to measure the force in this direction. I don't want to measure the force in this direction. Okay? But if you think about that, 
you still have some wires in this direction. These wires are uh, in the direction of the force that I don't want to measure. So it's true that if you apply this force here, you change the resistance of these wires because you stretch these wires. But if you apply a force in this direction, you will change the resistance of these wires. And therefore, the, resist the total resistance will change because you change the resistance also of these sections, which are shorter than the total length of the other sections in the vertical direction. But still, they might give you a small change of resistance which is not desired because you don't want the sensor to change resistance when you apply force in this direction. So what you do is to put more material here so that the resistance of these connecting sections will be much smaller, so definitely it will change. Because you apply a force, definitely this will change. But the total contribution of these connecting sections to the total resistance is very small. So even if it changes a little bit, who cares? Okay? Fine. Uh, there are multiple uh, arrangements for these sensors. Um, typically, you have uh, this, uh, this kind of, uh, of string gauges with uh, two or more sensors so that you can apply them to your device and you can measure the strain uh, not only in one direction, but for instance in this way, in this sensor you can measure uh, in vertical and horizontal direction. Here you can measure it in three directions. Here also. This is uh, for fish, uh, it's called fishbone because it has uh, a structure in fishbone uh, style and it can measure the force uh, in these two directions and it's used uh, commonly f to measure uh, the torque on some shaft. I will tell you later how it works. Fine. Uh, as I told you before, uh, definitely uh, the strain gauge depends on temperature. Uh, it could depend more or less, but it always depends on temperature because even if you talk about, you know, metals, metals still uh, have a resistance which depends on temperature. So, and as you know, every metal has a resistance which increases with temperature. So, in this case, we will observe changes of resistance which uh, are quite small. So it might be a question if you say, if you see, if you measure a change of resistance, whether if that change of resistance is given by the torque, uh, sorry, by the force, by the strain which deforms the sensor, or instead if it's caused by the temperature you see that the resistance has changed and you wonder, did it change because of the strain or did it change because of the temperature? Well, that's not easy to answer to this question. Uh, and here we arrive to a very basic principle of sensors, a technique which can be used in uh, several uh, other similar uh, configurations, similar uh, problems when you don't know if the response of a sensor is caused by the physical quantity that you want to measure, in this case strain, or by some other physical quantities that you don't want to measure, in this case temperature. You have multiple physical quantities which make your sensor change response and you want 
to rule out all the other possible changes of uh, all the uh, all the physical quantities uh, but one. So if you have multiple physical quantities which make your sensor change the response and you want your sensor to be sensitive only to one physical quantity, then you must be sure that uh, you can rule out all the other physical quantities and take only the changes of the output of the sensor, which are caused, which are uh, determined by the physical quantity you want to measure. In this case, we have two physical quantities that affect the output of the sensor, temperature and strain, and we want to rule out temperature because we want to take only the changes of resistance caused by the strain, by the force. How do you do that? The principle is very simple. You use two sensors. Two sensors which are exposed to the same temperature. So if the temperature changes for one sensor, it will change also for the second sensor. Uh, on the contrary, the first sensor will feel the force and the, and the sensor number two will not feel the force. Why? Because the sensor number one is placed with the sensitive direction parallel to the direction of the force, therefore will feel this force. And the resistor num uh, the strain gauge number two is horizontal, so it's orthogonal. It will feel the force in this direction, not in this direction. So I was saying, so you have two sensors, you have multiple physical quantities which affect the response, in this case, temperature and force. So the first sensor is exposed to both of them, the force that you want to measure and the temperature. The second one is exposed only to temperature. Why? It does because it doesn't feel the force uh, because we put it orthogonal to the uh, to the force. So it will sense the force in horizontal direction, but we exposed we expose it to a force which is uh, vertical. So it doesn't feel this force because it, its sensitive axis is horizontal. Fine. Um, so what happens if you have a resistance which changes on the first sensor, you don't know if it's caused by the force or by the temperature. You cannot say it was the temperature of the force. Then what you do is to watch at the second sensor. You observe a change of resistance on the first sensor, then you check on the second sensor. Has the resistance change of the same quantity? Well, if so, it means that the change of the resistance was given by the temperature and not by the force, because the second sensor doesn't feel the force. On the contrary, if you see a change of resistance on R1, on the first resistance, and uh, you, uh, you don't see it on the first, on the second sensor. I don't know which is the example I made before, sorry. Again, let me repeat. If you, say, if, you change, if you observe a change of resistance on the first sensor and you do not see it on the second sensor, it means it was caused by the force. If you see a change of resistance on the first sensor, but you see it also on the second, then it's caused by the temperature. Why? Because in the first case, the sensor number two doesn't feel the force, and in the sec so it's, uh, uh, if it doesn't feel the force, it means that it was the fo and you don't see the change, it means that it was the force which caused the uh, change of the resistance number one. On the second case, if you see the same 
change of resistance on both sensors, then it, it, it means that it was the only thing they have in common to cause the response to the, the change of resistance, which is the temperature. Okay? And it's always like that for every kind of sensor. If you have multiple physical quantities determining a change of the output of the sensor, then what you do is to put another sensor which fills all the physical quantities, but that one you want to measure. And then you observe the second sensor, the control sensor, if you see the change on both sensors, or the change on the first sensor that you want to measure is different than the change of, uh, of the output on the second sensor, which is always your check. Uh, another solution to get rid of, um, of um, to get rid of the of the dependence of the resistance in a strain gauge on the temperature is to use four identical sensors and put them in a bridge like this. I've already explained last week how to use this bridge uh, when I explained the measurement of uh, acceleration. So we had the cantilever with four strain gauges, two on the top, two on the bottom, just to remind you. If you have a cantilever like this, you have two strain gauges on the top, two on the bottom, and once the cantilever now, I am emphasizing it's stretched down by a force. The strain gauges on the top are extended, so the resistance increases. The one in the bottom, they are compressed. Therefore, the resistance decreases. And then you can arrange them in a bridge like this. So the one which increase with the force are the red ones. This one and this one are one and are four. The two resistances on the bottom, which decrease with the uh, with the force, are the blue ones, are two and are three. As you see here, there is an arrow which indicates uh, the fact that the resistance decreases with the force. And that's everything kinky door, it works fine. Now what happens when you increase the temperature? Well, if you increase the temperature, uh, it will increase everywhere the same, at least if there is not a gradient of temperature. But um, so if the temperature increases, increases for all materials. It doesn't mean that, uh, I don't know, if the temperature rises 10 degrees, some resistor magically decreases its temperature. If you have all equal sensors, they will all increase their resistance in the very same way, despite if they are on the top or on the bottom of the cantilever. Therefore, you can imagine that you have an extra resistor, RT, which is in series to all four sensors, and it will always increase with temperature. So you see here that we have R with upward arrow and T, R, T, R, T, R, T. These four green resistors are identical for all sensors because despite uh, or regardless the position where the sensor is, if the temperature is increasing, they are getting hotter the resistance gets bigger. So you have always an extra positive resistance, which is always increasing with the temperature. Fine. And uh, OK, I was referring to the resistance. OK, we, we will really talk about this question later. So I will finish here the topic and uh, uh, I will come maybe to the question later at the end of the lecture. Now, what is the advantage? The advantage is that if you have four resistors here 
in series to the four elements of this bridge, they will cancel each other because there are three, four equal resistors in the four elements of the bridge. So you can simply get rid of all these components, okay? Because they will simply uh, simplify it. They will not change the proportion of the uh, disequilibrium of the potential between this point and this point. Okay. Now, how to measure? There is a huge delay on YouTube. Wow. Yes, I do think so. I don't know why. Yes, I was guessing there was a huge delay on YouTube because uh, because I was getting the question much later. Anyhow, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope you didn't lose any uh, any comment, uh, any part of the lecture. But we are recording here, so I hope uh, the recording seemed to work just fine. So uh, if some part of the lecture was lost, you can watch it back and uh, later on the YouTube channel of the faculty. Uh, how to measure, so again, uh, as I explained, we have a small change of resistance uh, because uh, typically we have uh, not such a strong difference of length uh, or change of length. The deformation is very small. So if, if you have a metallic strain gauge, you get a factor of 2 to 4 as a multiplier of the relative change epsilon to get a relative change of resistance or relative change of uh, length epsilon to get a relative change of resistance. So if you have a small deformation, typically you get still a small change of resistance, which means that definitely we are going to use in the most uh, typical way and most typical configuration um, a bridge. And uh, this is a topic I've already explained briefly some time ago. Uh, if you have a bridge and which, as you remember, is used to measure a small change of resistance, <coughs> again, buried in a, in a much larger resistance, um, we cannot use an amplifier, uh, like an inverting amplifier, uh, for amplifying the output, output voltage, because then we would have the ground of the power supply of the bridge typically uh, shared with the ground of the um, of the inverting amplifier, because they they share the same power supply, for instance. And this means that this resistor here will be shorted, because it will be connected to the ground on the bottom and to the ground on the top. So what you have to do, and of course you cannot use either a non-inverting amplifier because again this point here will be connected to the ground. So again you short circuit this resistor and the bridge doesn't work on a, as a bridge anymore. Then what you have to use, as I told you, is a differential amplifier which is this part here. So you can either use only the differential amplifier, which is this part. Uh, in that case, you get the, diff the output voltage is the, uh, proportional to uh, the difference between this point and this point. And the gain is negative R3 divided by R2. Uh, the problem is that it will have an input current. And if you want, your amplifier to uh, absorb basically zero current from the bridge because you want here no current leaving this point and this point of the bridge. Otherwise, this is not a, a voltage divider anymore and all the calculations you did do not apply anymore. Uh, generally speaking, you want a voltmeter which has very large input impedance, which means zero current absorbed from the circuit, right? So you affect your circuit the least as possible because the moment you take out some current from the circuit, you are affecting your circuit. Uh, 
then if you really want to minimize the current you absorb from the bridge, you add this input stage here, where the input voltage V in is uh, the same voltage you have on this resistance R gain, because here we have a virtual short circuit. Here we have a virtual short circuit, so therefore this voltage here is brought to resistance R gain. Then you have a current which flows in the resistance R gain. It's the same current which flows through the two resistors R1, because here there is no current entering in the negative uh, inputs. Therefore, you have a voltage here, which will be V in divided by R gain, which is the current, times 2 R1 plus R gain. The purpose of this circuit is not only to amplify, because if you change this resistor again, you change the current in this, which flows in these three resistors in series. And therefore, uh, you have a different voltage here at the output between this point here and this point. And therefore, it will be, ampli it will be uh, ampli amplified by the second part, the differential amplifier, you will have a larger output voltage. So the purpose of this input stage is not only to amplify using this R gain. Uh, typically, you, uh, you buy this, uh, operation, this instrumentation amplifier as a wall chip. You don't build yourself an instrumentation amplifier with free op-amps. Uh, you simply buy an instrumentation amplifier and uh, they leave you two pins at the output where you can connect a resistor and, you tell, and they tell you which resistor you want to connect in order to achieve a, a certain gain. Okay? But the purpose is not only to amplify it, because otherwise we would have also this differential amplifier here, which amplifies uh, the difference of voltage. The main purpose of this input stage is to uh, increase the input resistance of the amplifier. In other words, to absorb the least current as possible from the circuit. And you see that the current here is very small because basically there is no uh, current which enters in the positive inputs of both the two input operation amplifiers. Okay? Uh, okay, here there are the sensors, but I think I will finish here because the time is almost over and there are almost, there are basically four minutes left. I know there's a delay on YouTube, so I will let you just a few minutes to watch uh, the remaining part of uh, YouTube if you manage to catch up with what I'm saying and to make me my question before the time is over. So I will wait you for, for, for questions if there is any. If not, you can disconnect and see you tomorrow.